But I was telling my dad, you know, we talked this morning and he prayed with me, which I really appreciate, and affirmed me, you know, because at times this can be a little, you know, you're dealing with your feelings and yourself and you're this and you're that. And we're not holier than thou. We're people, right. you know, and we're, we're weak and we try to stay focused and we try to stay plugged in and all of those things, you know. And sometimes you can just feel like, who am I, you know? Um, but I told him that back in September, I believe I got a word from the Lord. And I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't even praying. I wasn't reading my Bible. I was getting ready for work on a Monday morning, which is one of the most unspiritual places that I could be because I'm half asleep. You know, I got one eye open trying to tie my shoes. This is when I was waking up at 4.30 in the morning. And I was, for some reason, I was thinking about people that weren't at church the previous Sunday, the day before. And I don't think about that very often, you know. But for some reason, maybe it was a low turnout or something. I can't remember. But I was able to just kind of flip through people in my mind, and I'm not even trying to think about that. That's how random this is. Like, why would I be even thinking about that on a Monday morning? But I remember when I was thinking about the different people, these words just came through my mind. Was, don't trade your birthright for a bowl of soup. And I thought that was so odd. And I know that that was the Lord. He spoke that to me. And it's been my experience when he does speak to me like that, whether I'm praying or not praying, oftentimes it's a phrase or something from the scriptures. And I know that if you're not familiar with that scripture, that would sound like a very strange thing to think or think you heard from God. You know, don't trade your birthright for a bowl of soup. First of all, what is a birthright and what kind of soup are we talking about? Because <laughs> that's all the difference in the world, right? Clay, if it's gumbo, we it might be a little... I'll trade a lot of things for a good gumbo, you know what I mean? And the older I get, for some reason, the more I like gumbo. I don't know why, but I am going to get to your gumbo, by the way. Um, that's a little inside. But the, 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 that phrase comes from a passage in Genesis 25, 27 through 34. And that's my message title to you all this morning is, and this, you know, purpose of a title is so it sticks, but that's the title of this message is, Don't Trade Your Birthright for a Bowl of Soup. And that's easy to remember. So I hope that sticks with you, but that's straight out of the Word of God. You know, well, kind of. But it's from the Word of God. Not that, that's not a scripture. But it's from the Word of God. So I hope that sticks with you this morning as we leave here and go back into that world and, and live our lives as representatives of Christ, like Pastor David said last week. But Genesis 25, 27 through 34. As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. Skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman, but Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home. But Rebekah loved Jacob. One day, when Jacob was cooking some stew, or some gumbo maybe, Esau arrived home from the wilderness exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. His name Esau, I think, meant hairy because he was hairy. Straight out of the womb, he, they, the Bible talks about him. He looked like he was covered in fur. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? But, ja but Jacob said, he, he persisted, he, he wasn't joking. He said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob who was the younger brother. I should have gave you some context there. Esau had the birthright and the rightful uh, heir, if you will, to his father's entire estate. 
I'm going to get, I'm going to touch on that in a moment. Let me finish reading here. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. In these days, the firstborn had a lot of rights, including a double portion of the inheritance that was passed down by their father. Isaac got everything, the Bible says, that Abraham owned. And you may not know this, but Abraham actually had many sons from a different wife. I forget her name. It might have been like Keturah or something like that. But he had like eight sons with this other lady that we never hear about in the Bible. It's funny. I mean, we never hear about that lady. We hear about Sarah, Ishmael, and Isaac, the son through whom the promise was supposed to pass through. The covenant that God made with Abraham was passed through Isaac, the promised child, the one that God promised Abraham a son in his old age, and it was a miraculous conception and delivery of Isaac. And Isaac was the father of Esau and Jacob. So they had each, well, Esau was in line and had the rightful place to inherit all of his father's blessings and the, and the covenant. That was the most precious thing. And to be clear, Esau was not on his deathbed. I've heard somebody say that before. Well, if he was really dying, I mean, really, you know, maybe he's just all innocent. No, the Bible said that he showed contempt for his, for, for his rights as the firstborn. And to make it a little clearer in Hebrews, all the way later in the New Testament, chapter 12, verses 16 through 17, it says, now, now the church is being spoken to by the writer of Hebrews. Make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau. And, and the word... Godless is simply without God. Like Esau, who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. You know that afterward, when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance, even though he begged with bitter tears. And that's my heart in sharing this with us this morning I want to be clear that any time we share the word of God, we're held accountable to that same word. And we're trying to live this thing out and grow in God's word, manifesting in our life at the same time whoever we're talking to is. So I, I want to be clear as I go through this message this morning that my heart in this is that it would be terrible if people in this room had to beg with bitter tears, but it was too late. That would be terrible. I wouldn't want that for anybody, much less somebody that's under the sound of my voice or I have the potential or opportunity to speak to. Don't trade your birthright for a bowl of soup. Don't trade the eternal for the temporal. Don't trade tomorrow for today. Every day, all day, we have an enemy, the devil, who is trying to get us to trade away our birthright. Every single day, all day, the world is trying to get you to trade your birthright. Every single day, all day long, your flesh is trying to get you to trade that birthright. So why did Esau do it? Why? Why would he do that? He, he probably had the greatest gift and the greatest inheritance that could possibly be had. Except now we have Christ. We have an eternal life. It's, it's, a different, it's different now, and it's open to all of us. But at that time, before Christ, he had the lineage. He had the covenant. He had the promise. We can say things like he took it for granted, he was distracted, maybe he didn't spend enough time at home because the Bible says he was a man of the wilderness, he was always out there hunting, Jacob was at home. But 
I want to zero in with you guys on a, a main reason that we can just focus on. And that is a lack of spiritual vision. The Bible says that he was godless without God. And how could he possibly on earth have spiritual vision, spiritual eyesight, and he wasn't even connected to God? Proverbs 29, 18 in the Amplified says, Where there is no vision, no revelation of God and his word, the people are unrestrained. But happy and blessed is he who keeps the law of God. In the King James, that, that verse says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Because Esau didn't see the value of what he had. He couldn't see the value of that birthright. You know, it, it could have been when God approached Moses in the burning bush, he could have said, I am the God of your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But you know what? Esau went on, and his ancestors was the Edomites. Because his name was, he got a new name, Edom. Because he was red. And the Lord was still kind to Esau, believe it or not. Blessed him, made him a great nation and spared the Edomites from the Israelites. God told the Israelites to leave the Edomites alone because they were the descendants of Esau. So God was still kind. Probably more so for Isaac and Abraham because Esau was godless. Pastor Dick Bashter, we're doing a Bible survey of every book in the Bible this year. It's incredible with the school of ministry that we're a part of. And in those notes, he says, Esau gave up his long-term purpose for immediate gratification. If we don't see and value our God-given identity and purpose, we can easily be lured away by the things in this life that may offer a more immediate gratification. Smell, taste, feel, touch, hear. You know, we can be very sensual. You know, that's immediate gratification. Sometimes things that are not seen or seem far away, man, I'm just not worried about that. I want something that I can touch, feel, pay. You know, let's, let's make something happen. You know, and if I got to make something happen, and it means I got to put my identity and my God-given purpose to, on the back burner, well, then so be it. That was Esau's attitude. If I got to get this bowl of stew and tell Jacob he's got my birthright, then so be it. What's, he said, what use is my birthright to me now? If I'm starving of death, I mean, I'm starving to death. It was still incredibly valuable, right. even if he would have starved to death. Right. If he had still held on to the birthright, it would be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Even if he starved to death because his brother wouldn't feed him some food. Pastor Jim Clark, a very well-respected pastor, has had a big influence in all of our local pastors that I can just keep hearing his name come up over and over. He said, vision is the awareness of your life's ministry. God is a God of purpose, reason, cause, plan, and strategy. Nothing has or ever will be done by God without purpose. He made each of us on purpose and for a purpose. It is our individual responsibility to seek, and it is the Holy Spirit's job to inform us of our God-assigned purpose for our life. If Esau would have just taken up his responsibility to seek, what is God, what is your purpose for my life? That story could be a lot different. Now Jacob ends up with it. He ends up with all the rights of the firstborn. He's the younger son. 
And obviously the weaker son, I would say, if he's hanging out at the house making tea with mom and Esau is out in the wilderness killing something and eating it raw, probably. <laughs> Sounds like that kind of guy. That's another reason why he wasn't starving of death. He wasn't starving to death. That dude would have whacked off a cactus and ate it, I'm sure. He could have, but he had to have this stew. He had to have a bowl of gumbo, you know. Come on, Esau. Jacob got it, though, because he valued it. He saw the value. In a sense, it was like the parable that Jesus shared with the pearl of great price. He saw the value of that pearl and sold everything he had to get the pearl, hoping that nobody else would see how valuable it was. He couldn't sell everything he had fast enough. And Jacob saw the birthright, and there's a second part to that, the blessing, which I'm not going to cover too much, but he stole Esau's blessing. He stole it. He, He got Esau to sell him his birthright for a bowl of gumbo, and then he stole his blessing. That sounds mean. It sounds wrong. But in context... If Esau was treating it with contempt, was it really wrong that Jacob stole it? The blessing of God? The Abraham covenant? I imagine that Esau and Jacob heard all about Papa and his promise from God. Heard all about Isaac being the miracle child, their dad. Heard all about, I will make you a father of many nations. That it's through your descendants I'm going to bless the whole earth. I bet you Esau and Jacob heard that over and over and all the time. And this is what I picture. I picture these two little boys, they're twins. And all Esau can think about is going hunting. All Esau can think about is going outside. When is this going to be over so I can go do what I want to do? And Jacob was like, tell me more. He was hanging out at the house, tell me more. Sipping tea with his mom. I don't know if they drank tea back then, but whatever. Coffee. Tell me more. So while Esau took it for granted the birthright that he already had. He didn't have to do anything for it. It was his. Jacob envied his brother for that birthright, envied that blessing. And I can imagine Jacob complaining to his mom after school one day, Mom, Esau doesn't even care about his birthright or his blessing or the covenant and the promises God gave to Dad and Papa. Why can't I have it instead? And then and Rebecca's like, you're right, Jacob, and I want you to have it. You're right. Esau doesn't care about it, and it's so valuable. I'll help you get it. And you know it's unfortunate. Anything in God's word, we can apply it to our lives. You just got to ask God to help you see that. So we can never make the excuse like, I wasn't getting fed, or I, this or that. You can get fed from the bread of the word of God. You just got to be hungry, and you got to go eat it, and you got to ask God to use it to reveal that to you. But what I saw in Esau is how it could represent a people, a religious people. You know, they hem and haw about having to go to church. Are they looking for a way out? They, they get excited when they have a good excuse not to have to go to church on a Sunday morning or a small group or prayer or whatever, telling somebody about Jesus, kingdom. They're half tuned out while the word of God is preached. They're spectators during worship instead of presenting themselves before God, worshiping and honoring and thanking him for their birthright that they didn't deserve. We didn't deserve it. I can picture Esau sitting there looking at the clock. Hey, he's been preaching for 15 minutes already. It feels like an hour. <laughs> it was only 15 minutes. Damn, we still got another 15 minutes to go, 20 minutes, whatever. You know, and, and being 
uh, annoyed that this church stuff, this promise, Abraham covenant stuff is eating into my time, eating into my hunting time, sitting in the deer stand or whatever, however you hunted. I think he just had a spear and went and just chased it down. That's, that's how Esau sounds to me. In their eyes, all they see is church and an organization. They don't see a kingdom with a king and sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. They view themselves as church members, not as sons of God advancing God's kingdom. I feel like that would be a good description of like, if Esau was here with us today, he would fit that description. Jesus is offering a birthright to us that we didn't deserve. Will we value it or will we take it for granted? Look at what happened when Jesus told some people to follow him in Luke 9, 59 through 62. He said to another person, come, follow me. The man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. I know that can sound harsh. I understand that. But he was trying to help us to see what these people, they had no idea who was talking to them. Think of the most important person, most powerful person you can think of. If that person was like, hey, can you come give me a hand with this? Is there any excuse that you could think of that was like, Sure, but just wait one moment. It's revealing. I know we can sit there and go back and forth about right, wrong, and they were justified and blah, 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 but it's revealing that the first words out of their mouth is an excuse why they can't come right away, why they can't lay down everything they have to follow Jesus. And you notice they didn't say no. Many of us... Never say no. I bet you nobody in this room has ever told God no. I take that back. I've told God no. <laughs> but as far as following him as a Christian, you would never tell God no, but you can make an excuse, and you can procrastinate, and you can delay, and you can put it on the back burner pretty easy, huh? Right. As long as you don't say no, it's not that bad. We need to ask ourselves, how hard is it for something to come up to keep us from being active in the body of Christ? Is making excuses second nature to us? It's just so easy. I can get out of anything, and I feel bad about it because I'm so good at making excuses. When the Holy Spirit is knocking on the door of our heart, convicting us, leading us, challenging us, are we just so good at making excuses and just ignoring that whisper? No time, too tired, not feeling well, something else going on, make plans, not my thing, too nervous, too, too busy, too dangerous. We should already have a plan in our minds on what God wants us to be doing and where he wants us to be and when and an extremely limited list of things that could interrupt that. You know, because life happens. I'll give you an example. We're here Sunday morning, right? I'm going to be here every Sunday morning for the rest of my life until God moves me or we're sick and we don't want to get you sick because I'm actively sick. I'm like germs gushing out my body. I don't want to get you sick. Or it's like, a tornado outside, and I don't want to drive into a tornado, so it's like, I'll see you next week. I'm just saying that there's, there would be such a limited list. Right. You know, we go out of town, we go on vacation, so that's something that might come up where, no big deal. It's not a big deal. It's not like we have to have perfect attendance 
at everything that is going on with the group of people that we're serving with in our local church. That's totally understandable. But what the local church represents is the kingdom of God at work on the earth that God wants us to be plugged into his body because every one of us has a part to play in that body being as productive and powerful as it can be on this earth to represent Jesus to the people so that they can come into his kingdom. So we're sold out. Right, Rachel? We're sold out. There is nothing else. There's nothing else more important than this. And I believe and I trust that God will tend to anything that I think might suffer as a result of our commitment. Anything. Family time. Y'all know it takes time to prepare messages and to go to conferences and do schools and things like that. But what about our kids? What about that? Work. I still, we still got to make money. We're trusting the, the Lord for the money. We're trusting the Lord that our children are going to have a wonderful childhood. They're going to have a wonderful relationship. They're going to have everything that they need from mommy and daddy. They won't lack for a thing. They're going to grow up strong. We're going to show them the ways of the Lord. They're going to have, we're going to have the most amazing relationship with them. And the Lord helps us to do that. He taught us through people that why don't you do once a week, one-on-one time with your children, called TWP, Time with Parents. Some wonderful friends of ours who just took over a church in Mississippi, they said they have six kids, and they're very busy. So they intentionally take turns alternating. Dad will take one of the kids out, and then the next week, Mom will take the next kid out. And then the dad will take the next kid out, and they just keep alternating. And Ava and I just did that Thursday or Friday, Thursday, I think it was Thursday. And she got $3.25 saved up, and we went to the Dollar Tree. <laughs> and she was so precious. I wanted to cry the whole time. We were walking in Dollar Tree. I was holding her hand. She had a little purse. Oh. And it was jingling with all of her change. Oh. And I was trying to help her understand how many quarters she had, which makes dollars and Everything in Dollar Tree is a dollar twenty-five now due to inflation. <laughs> and then I tried to explain to her that that's not it. You got to put tax on top of that because we got to pay the government, <laughs> which is fine. But it's like that's not really the total. You got to stick the tax in there on the end while you're paying. But we went through all of that. It was so precious. And then we went to Racetrack Gas Station and got a frozen yogurt. She loves that. And we sat there and we ate frozen yogurt together. And it was sweet. We talked. It was sweet. So that's just one of the ways that God, if he redeems the time. You think, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. But what you'll find, if you'll be faithful to the Lord, is he'll redeem the time. He'll multiply time you thought you didn't have. Or he'll make better quality of the time that you do have. It's amazing. The same thing with finances. Same thing with any talent, right. treasure, or time that you possess, that you're a steward of. God will make sure that you have what you need and more if you'll commit it all to him. Right. You talk about finances, I could be here all day long telling you about that. I have way more than I deserve that I've ever worked for. Way more. I've been gifted more than I have ever earned, I feel like. You know, he's multiplied what I've used. He's done so much. And the whole time, we're giving it away to him. Right. And honestly, can't give it away fast enough or large enough. Right. Every time, it's like, ooh, that one hurts. Then he gives it back some other big way, and it's like, man, that's silly. I mean, why was I ever worried about, why was I ever worried about money? That's right. It's all time. God can compress and stretch and do things with time that would blow your mind. Time is nothing to God. He lives outside of time. We're constrained by time. Right. None of these things matter to God. Right. The only thing that matters is your heart. Right. And he had Jacob's heart, and he did not have Esau's heart. So what are you committed to? We must give up immediate gratification and trust God with our lives. Matthew 16, 24 through 26 says, 
Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, die. I mean, that's like the deepest depth of self-abandonment. Die. You mean I can't take, you mean I can't make sure that this is taken care of? You mean I can't make sure that that's taken care of? You mean I can't make sure? No. You come and let me handle that. If you want to stay and take care of that, then you're not coming. And you're going to be left doing the best you can with that stuff. And you're not good at it. Or you can just abandon it, trust me with it, follow me, and I'll take care of that stuff like you can't imagine. He says, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If we think that we can do better, know better, and set the kingdom of God to the side for our own good, we're sadly mistaken. If we think that's the solution, set the kingdom of God to the side, so I can tend to my business, if you think that is the solution, you are sadly mistaken. We need to trust God that he knows what we need. He knows what our families need. He knows what our children need. He knows what our boss needs. He knows what our bank account needs. He knows all of these things. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Test God in this. Trust him. Truly put God first, even at the expense of things that can't be put on the back burner for anything. They can be put on the back burner for God. And they're not really on the back burner when you do that. They're on the front burner. They're on his front burner. They went from your front burner and not going to your back burner, but to his front burner. But it feels like we're putting it on the back burner. It feels like we're putting it on our back burner and that we're not going to be tending to it like it needs to be tended to. Do I have time for a quick story real quick? So I was in PJ's Coffee, I guess 11 years ago or so, because my wife and I have been married 10 years this year. And I was in, I was in PJ's Coffee, and I used to scroll through Facebook and all this, looking to see what girls were out there, what kind of prospects were out there. And every Sunday I'd come to church and I'd be looking around, no, none today, you know, just waiting for, like, my dream wife to walk through the doors. Like, man, you know. How am I going to find her from just here, you know, and all that? So I saw my, I saw my, you know, I'm doing that. And the Holy Spirit convicted me. He said, you're not trusting me with this. And those exact words. I was like, oh. Like I was busted. I'm like, you're right. And I can't escape. When he speaks to you, you can't escape. Don't try. So he showed me that I needed to trust him with that. I needed to hand it to him. And the way he showed it was like my coffee mug. If I had a coffee mug and in imaginary world, like that coffee mug was like the most precious thing to me, the most important thing. And I would just cling to it and brood over it and just focus on it and worry about it and use all my time. Everything was like about that thing. And God was saying, give it to me. And I could see in the spirit, but it was like a physical picture, was like, okay, I'm I'm handing this thing to you. And he's like peeling my fingers off of it. I got it. I got it. (laughs) It's like, okay, but if I don't have it, then how's it ever going to get taken care of? If I'm not looking and doing like my part, trust me. So I let it go. Like, all right. And then he showed me like, now that you don't have it, That means you don't have it. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to plan about it. He he challenged me. I don't want you to think about it. So every time that I would be tempted to think about it, I had to hurry up and get it out of my mind, redirect. And what he told me to do was to instead focus on the kingdom of God. Focus on my kingdom. Use every opportunity. Every time you think about that, replace it with how can you 
advance God's kingdom? How can you give the devil headaches? So that's what I did. I took him seriously. I had to. This is faith. This is the walk of faith. There was no people involved. There wasn't even words, because this was all just a mental exchange between me and God. And would you know that one month later, I met Rachel on the beach in Florida, of all places? That's incredible. And would you know, I've said this story before, but would y'all know that she was dating somebody for three years? Pretty cool dude from what I gather. He was like a politician at 21. <laughs> she, she didn't like politicians. She said she would never marry a politician. But um, would y'all know that a month before we met, she broke up with him? after dating him for three years? So Jacob was blessed. Oh my goodness, was he blessed. Jacob had so many experiences with God. In Genesis 28, he had a dream with the angels going up and down the stairway of heaven. In Genesis 32, he encountered an angel of the Lord. In Genesis 32, also he actually had a wrestling match with the Lord himself. And won. Oh my gosh. Like, talk about your relationship with God. I wrestled him one time and I won. <laughs> and what's so cool about that story, if y'all go back and read it, it was like I was trying to get away from him, like his time was up. Like, I can't be doing this anymore. I got other things to get to. And Jacob wouldn't let him go. He valued the Lord. He valued spiritual things. And he said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. Doesn't that sound like the same Jacob who schemed to steal Esau's blessing? Who got his brother to sell him his birthright? He said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And the Lord did bless him. And he changed his name from Jacob to Israel. That could have been Esau. Luke, 20, Luke 12, I'm going to wrap this up real quick. Luke 12, 35 through 38. Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning as though you were waiting for your master to return from the wedding feast. Then you will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. The servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded. I tell you the truth. He himself, listen to this, y'all. He himself will seat them put an apron on, and serve them while they sit and eat. The master. He may come in the middle of the night or just before dawn, but whenever he comes, he will reward the servants who are ready. The servants who have spiritual vision, who see the value of the master coming, who see the value of what he, the master told us to do of what he wants us to do, what he wants us to be a part of, who he wants us to be around, what he wants us to be doing. Pastor David shared last week that we are called for such a time as, as this, that there is no coincidences. There's no coincidence that you are who you are, the age you are, where you are in 2023 A.D. Romans 8, 29 through 30. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to be like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chose them, chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. That's what he wants to do. That's the birthright. That's the blessing, is that we get to have him. We get to have his glory. We get to have a relationship with him. Esau gave up his long-term purpose for immediate gratification. Don't trade your birthright for a bowl of soup. Instead, see the value of your eternal identity and purpose. You have a purpose. Esau had a purpose. He had an eternal identity 
and purpose. But he didn't see it. We each have a mandate on our lives to destroy the works of the devil, set the captives free, and seek and save that which was lost. We each have a unique part to play. We, the body of Christ, need every member where they belong, doing what they are called and gifted to do, and firing on all cylinders. Can you all imagine what a room like this of people can do with the power of God, where they belong, doing what they're called to do, gifted to do, and firing on all cylinders? The work is just too great for just a few. We need every single person, every hand on deck. The labor is a few. The harvest is right, but the labor is a few. We are called to make disciples of the whole world. The whole world. Not just Covington, not just your neighborhood. The whole world. And there's no way that we can do it on our own or with just a few. That work is, that effort is compounded as we come together to do that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Y'all can bow your heads with me this morning.